This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 77 was recorded on August 24th, 2017. I'm Eric Townsend. So much is going on in the crude oil market that we decided to dedicate the whole show this week as a crude oil special. Former U.S. Department of Energy Chief of Staff Joe McMonigle will be joining me as our feature interview guest. Joe and I will discuss everything from supply and demand fundamentals to inventory levels to geopolitical risks in Venezuela and Iran to what we can expect as we get closer to the Saudi Aramco IPO. But wait, there's more. Patrick and I will be joined in our post-game segment by professional oil trader Tracy Shukart, call sign Shy Girl on Twitter. We'll be asking Tracy for her perspective on my interview with Joe, as well as what the charts are telling her about the near and intermediate term direction of the crude oil market. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, let's get into the uh, markets here. The S&P 500 hovering around this 2437 level. I've been uh, talking with my members about this uh, kind of 20-point range between 2435 to 55 kind of being a consolidation point. And the S&P doesn't seem to want to uh, show its hand as to which direction it's going to go. What's your feeling about where we're going with the S&P? Well, you know, I just look at a couple of attempts this week to get back above the 50-day moving average that both failed. The first one was a little bit more valiant. It got it up. It looks like it reversed right around 24.53 or so, which was the volume-weighted average price line, and went took that out, took out the 50-day moving average, which is 24.48. Tried again today, just barely touched 24.48 at the 50, and uh, didn't make it. So it seems like, you know, this, this chart it's not finding much strength. I think it's fair to say that we are definitely in at least a short-term bearish trend, having now seen a series of three progressively lower highs and two progressively lower reaction lows. So a nice little downsloping price channel is forming there on this chart. But, you know, I I think it's important to say this is a fairly modest sell-off. It's not like we're crashing or something. At the worst that we've seen so far, it was 3% off of the all-time highs. But I think the question to ask is, do we really have the ingredients to see a true bear market starting now or a crash I don't see it. I think that what we're seeing is a fairly modest sell-off, which is perfectly natural. We've we've seen a very frothy market that was at the very top of its upward sloping channel line. So it's time for a normal correction, and it's only been a small dip. The one thing I do see, though, is if you got to some sort of stalemate or uh, you know impasse in the debt ceiling negotiation, and there was actually a technical default on a treasury bond payment, that could cause just massive panic in market. And I I think that the politicians involved underestimate how bad that could be if it were to happen. Uh, as far as a, a government shutdown that's just for show, you know, we go through this every couple of years. I don't see that as a big deal unless we get to a defaulted bond payment. So, you know, I, I think it remains to be seen what happens here, but I don't think that the fears of a imminent crash that people have are going to actually happen unless there is an escalation of the debt ceiling or a budget crisis or, you know, something else goes wrong politically. Right now, what we're seeing is just seems to me like a very small pullback. Well, let's move on to that U.S. dollar. Now, the U- obviously, the U.S. dollar index had a substantial decline through the months of uh, June and July. But since then, basically, August has been a very tight range, pretty much defined to about a dollar uh, between that kind of 92.5 to 93.5 range on the dollar index. What's your feeling? Is this a bottom on the dollar or are we still going lower? Well, you know, it seems like if you go back to our August 3rd show, we talked about Juliet de Klerk's view and the research that she shared with our listeners, saying she expected a bounce at that point to occur, and she said, short that bounce because we're going lower. Well, we've seen the bounce. We got from 92 spot 35 or so all the way up to just over 94, 
And now we're back down as we're speaking uh, to 93 spot 21 after testing uh, uh, low teens, 93 spot 12 or so earlier in the day today. So I think the big question, if we do get back below 92 and a half, especially if we go below 92.35, which was the previous low, well, Juliet really was proven right. And in that case, I'd be looking for Juliet's euro target of a dollar thirty to the euro as maybe where that bottoms. I think eventually we're going to see a bottom and it's going to be time to buy the dip. I do still see the structural long-term bullish argument for the U.S. dollar. It's just a question of how much longer this route lasts. And it looks to me like it's not over yet. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil. Obviously, this week is a crude oil special. So uh, why don't you prime us up with what uh, we're looking at on oil before uh, the interview? Yeah, I want to leave most of it for the feature interview and our post-game segment with Tracy Shukart because I've got a lot to say on the charts and the current price action and so forth. I want to get Tracy to consult with me because, frankly, she's a more experienced technical analyst than I am. So let's just start with the inventory basics. Crude oil drawing down 3.3 million barrels nationally, pretty much in line with expectations, and that's a welcome change because we've had several weeks of massive drawdowns, much bigger than expectations. This one was very much in line with expectations. Cushing, Oklahoma drawing down 503,000 barrels. Gasoline drawing down 1.2 million barrels. Not the build in gasoline that some people feared after the API report to still its building, but only a de minimis 28,000 barrels. U.S. production ticked up again about a quarter of a percent to 9.528 million barrels per day. The reaction to that data was actually a down spike initially in prices, but very quickly recovering to the upside. We, uh, we saw prices moving up all day on Wednesday, but then they rolled over into Thursday, something that has happened since our interview view with Joe McMonagall was taped on Wednesday morning is that Tropical Storm Harvey has escalated to Hurricane Harvey, and that has changed things a little bit. Believe it or not, I think that the bearish action that we saw on Thursday in the crude oil market was a result of this Tropical Storm, now Hurricane. Now, that might sound backwards because Hurricane Harvey has already shut in 10% of Gulf of Mexico production. Taking production offline, you'd think that that would push prices up because there would be supply destruction. Well, yes, that would normally be true, but this storm is not only going to affect the oil rigs out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. This thing is pointed straight at the Houston Ship Channel, and they're already evacuating some of the Gulf Coast refineries. So the logic here is, although taking Gulf of Mexico production offline should mean higher crude oil prices, taking refineries offline, which are the consumers of that crude oil, that is demand destruction, and that means lower prices. As of Thursday's tape action, it looks like demand destruction is winning out. The other thing to keep in mind is the logic has changed a little bit. In the past, we used to say, okay, if there's a storm in the Gulf of Mexico, it means imports can't get into port. Well, what's changed, and Sam Madani explained this on this program a few weeks ago, is that the U.S. now exports quite a bit of crude oil. So the phenomenon that occurs when there's a storm is that the inbound ships rush as much as they can trying to beat the storm into port, whereas the outgoing ships don't sail. They stay in port and they wait for the weather to pass before they leave. And the fact that the exports are not leaving has just as much effect as fewer imports coming in. So for that reason, I think it's quite likely that we'll see a build on inventory next week because next week's report would be reference this week's actual action in the market. And this storm is going to have a very significant impact. So that's what's uh, sort of the new news that's developed since we recorded on Wednesday morning the interview with Joe McMonagall. I'm going to leave the rest of the crude oil coverage for Joe and Tracy Shukart in our postgame segment. All right, well, then let's move on to gold here. And pretty much for a whole week, we've hovered just right under the 1300 level. And every time it seems like gold wants to break out, it just stays in this range. But we haven't really broken down either. It's been this very quiet little lull here in gold right at that round number. What's your thinking about the next direction in gold here? Well, you described it perfectly, Patrick. We're, we're hanging out and just coasting along, flirting with that resistance number. We saw a false breakout last week up to 1306. It didn't last. We came back down below that key resistance level, which is around 
twelve ninety five or so, but yeah, or twelve ninety seven in there somewhere. But we came down to what we're looking at twelve ninety one as we're speaking on Thursday afternoon. You know, that's not a breakdown. When you talk about a false breakout to the upside, sometimes being a very bearish signal, it's a bearish signal when it is dramatically rejected. If we were suddenly at twelve fifty, I would say, okay, that was a false upside breakout, very strong rejection. That means this is a bearish signal. That's not what we're looking at, Patrick. We're looking at $3 below that critical level. So gold is still trying to break through that key resistance. Remains to be seen whether it's going to happen or not. And just finally, your comments on the uh, interest rates here, the 10-year Treasury yield still hovering down at that uh, 219 level, and it doesn't seem to be letting up. And We keep seeing these lower interest rates on the 10 and the 30 years. Uh, What's your feeling about uh, the next uh, move in the bond markets? Well, we've edged down just a little bit, I think just a couple of basis points since we did the show last week. And I think it's because of this weakness and sentiment change in the stock market. Money is coming out of the stock market that tends to result in lower yields. I don't see what's going on here is a significant move that's telling, though. You know, when we see a breakout uh, either below 212 or above 240 in yield on the 10 year, that's going to tell me, okay, the next move is on. We're not seeing that happen yet. So we're still just drifting around in the middle of the range. I'm waiting to see a sign of a significant directional move, and we're not seeing it yet. Thanks for the market wrap, Eric. Joining us as this week's featured interview guest is former U.S. Department of Energy Chief of Staff and regular Macro Voices listener, Joe McMonigle. Now, Eric's interview with Joe is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here on MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now as this week's featured interview guest is former U.S. Department of Energy Chief of Staff Joe McMonigle, who now heads up the energy research team at Hedgeye. Joe, I think everybody understands that the key question in today's oil market is whether the rebalancing that OPEC production cuts were supposed to achieve is really happening or if the supply glut is actually still continuing. So let's start with your high-level view first. Is OPEC effectively managing supply or are they really just managing market sentiment? Well, I think to date, they have been managing sort of sentiment and, of course, engaging in sort of verbal intervention in the market. Yes, they did do this production cut deal a year ago. Well, actually, last November, they're eight months into that deal now. And it's really had not that much of an impact on the market. I think originally when the deal was was announced, I think oil bulls really liked the idea and prices, you know, were were boosted as a result. But, you know, many people, a lot of very savvy oil analysts and forecasters at banks predicted big inventory draws in the spring that just never materialized. And and of course, the return of higher prices has, of course, encouraged shale to rise, which, of course, we can get into later because it's a sort of a different phenomenon. But just to really judge the effectiveness of the production cut deal, last Friday, oil ended at uh, or settled at 47 and some change. It was actually lower, a penny lower than it was a year ago. So just to judge, I mean, obviously, prices in the last couple of days have fluctuated a little bit. But, you know, really, if you're looking at where prices were a year ago where versus where they are today, I don't think the you can really say that the production cut deal has had a lot of influence or has been very effective. And I think as a result, the market started out really impressed. And I think they've been pretty disappointed as we're into month eight now, almost nine months of the deal. OPEC has another meeting coming up on November 30th, and as we all know, they're in the habit of using the periods leading up to these meetings to sort of jawbone the market with their various propaganda announcements. So there's been talk about the production cuts maybe being extended or even increased at this meeting. There's also been rumors about maybe taking exempt countries that didn't participate in the cuts and making them not exempt next time around. So what do you see actually happening on November 30th, and how do you think the propaganda campaign is going to play out between now and then? Yeah, so I think you're totally right. The job owning is, is really part of the OPEC playbook. And I think what you're, you know, you're going to see over the next two weeks now, even before August is over, 
I think, two competing narratives. One, you're going to start seeing from the Saudis announcements or leaks about big cuts in crude exports, particularly to the U.S. And they sort of signal that they were going to do that in July. I certainly expect them to have done it. Of course, a lot of it has to do with you know, lower demand uh, from China as well. But they will show some big cuts, I think, in crude exports. And then juxtapose that with, I think, what you're going to see from the U.S., which we've seen really, I think, throughout the summer. And that's really rising U.S. production. And a lot of other forecasts from banks and other oil analysts about rising U.S. production. And and I think uh, Barclays came out with a a report, forecast report earlier this week or late last week, you know, that had oil going to 10 and a half million barrels a day by the end of 2018. So I think you're going to start seeing more of that. And I think that's really making it difficult for OPEC to sort of regain the narrative about the production cut deal. And I think they badly want to try to get that back. In terms of the next meeting, already yesterday you had the Kuwait oil minister say, uh, that they're going to make a decision to consider whether to extend the production cut deal or to basically end it. Unfortunately, neither of those scenarios is really what the market wants to hear. I think the market wants to hear that there's going to be deeper cuts. And that's really not been on the table. I think there was some potential anticipation of that, potentially at the last OPEC meeting, we thought there really wasn't a chance of that happening. We wrote a, a note for, for clients that basically said, longer, not deeper, was, was the title of our note. I think at the very least, you're looking at another extension. Even though it's extended into the end of first quarter 2018, I think they will probably want to signal at that November meeting that they will extend. I think that's at a minimum. However, I would not preclude potentially more drastic action at that meeting. But I, I think it's too early to tell. I think we have to really see where the market is in late October and early November. And I think the main reason for that is really the Aramco IPO coming up. And I think it's just, you know, we're going to talk about that later, I think. But I think, you know, that's really, it's a central focus of the the Saudi Arabia government, of their economic reforms. Uh, so they have a lot riding on it. And therefore, I think there's the potential that there could be some unilateral Saudi action of deeper cuts. So that's something I'm, I've now put in the realm of possibility as I look at the different options coming up at the November 30th meeting. I want to come back to the Aramco IPO in a few minutes, but let's start with touching on the official U.S. data that comes from your former employer, the Department of Energy. It used to be pretty easy to read these reports, but lately we're kind of getting conflicting data. There were quite a few much bigger than expected drawdowns in crude oil inventory in recent weeks, although this week it appears to be much more in line with inventory, uh, around 3 million barrel drawdown, which is for this time of year pretty normal. Those would those big drawdowns would have been very bullish, but then... We we also see that there's been steadily increasing domestic production in these Wednesday reports. That would be a bearish sign. But then on Fridays, we get the rig count, which looks like it's finally starting to level off a little bit. So that would tend to go the other way. When you net all these things together, what do you see in the data? Are we looking at a bona fide rebalancing of the market that's actually occurring? Or is there still a production glut? I guess I side on the production glut side. I mean, actually, you know, I, I, I think certainly there's been some drawdowns and I think that's positive news. It's hard, you know, it's impossible to say it's not positive news. Although I think, you know, most observers thought the drawdowns would occur sooner and they'd be even greater than they, than they are. But a sustained several weeks now of drawdowns, I think, has been positive. As you point out, the signals, however, about rising U.S. production to really record levels and the resiliency of U.S. shale, I think, is really a big counterweight to these inventory draws. Now we're also entering a phase here, you know, where the end of summer, you know, the high demand season is going to be switching over and there's going to be refinery maintenance. And so I think a lot of the, the contributing factors in terms of gasoline and other product inventories 
are probably going to start stalling out. And so I think I think you're going to see the market struggle here in the fall, even with further draws. And of course, you know, crude exports from the U.S., which now are allowed as a result of lifting the crude export ban uh, in 2016. I think, first of all, no one really thought until prices really recovered to, to big levels that there would be significant exports. But again, you know, the market has really been surprised, I think, about very strong crude exports. And of course, that's affecting the drawdown numbers as well. So it's, I think it's a much more complicated data array to consider now uh, as we go into the fall. And I think definitely you put your finger on it. The U.S. production uh, number, I think, is the big complicating factor, what would otherwise be very bullish news. Related to that, Art Berman had a piece out recently saying exactly really what you just said, which is that this is not what it appears. These big inventory drawdowns are not because of increased demand or reduced production. It's all about reduced imports. And Art thinks that's not sustainable. Some people have even gone so far as to say that maybe OPEC and Saudi Arabia are kind of trying to game the system so that that overproduction that's still occurring is showing up and builds an inventory, but it's happening someplace other than the United States, where the data is not nearly as visible to traders. Do you think there's any truth to that idea? I, I totally agree with that analysis. I, we've actually been putting out notes about this for clients. And again, this was telegraphed by the Saudis in particular. And essentially, I like to call it working the refs, you know, because the U.S., the EIA data, weekly data reports, is the most transparent. It's also every week. The OECD numbers come out monthly. The rest of the world is not so transparent, so it's hard to judge really what's going on in those other markets. So the market was basically living off of these EIA reports, which were not that great for OPEC and the Saudis in the spring. And so they needed to really change the data, you know, essentially. And and so, you know, the only way to do that was to really just impact the data through their exports to the U.S. And so they've done that. They tried to get a few other OPEC members involved in that plan. And I think it's it's definitely having some effect. The time of year is also really important. Saudi Arabia uses a lot of oil for energy or for domestic electricity usage during the summer. So from a period of time perspective, sort of worked perfectly in their plan but I also agree with, with what Art said. It's just not sustainable. I mean, once, once the summer season ends in, in Saudi Arabia and they're, they're going to be di- dialing back their electricity usage, they're going to look to you know, reverse those crude export cuts. And, so, and the other part that he makes, which, of course, we've seen as well, is that they really just, in, in the case of the Saudis in particular, redirected those exports to Asia And so the market is still hitting the global market, or the oil is still hitting the global market, just not hitting the U.S., and it's just specifically to impact the EIA data. And they've they've definitely had an impact. And I think it's actually been a little greater because of the U.S. crude export numbers. Speaking of sustainable trends, we have seen a trend which is increasing U.S. production. Just this week's data, another quarter of a percent or so of increase in U.S. production. On the other hand, it looks like the rig count is not growing as quickly as it had been. So what's your outlook? Do you see uh, U.S. production continuing to increase through 2018? I do. I mean, look, shale is just so resilient here. You know, I yeah, the rig counts are, are, are sort of The growth of the increases, I think, are drawing off a little bit, but I still expect rig counts to continue. Certainly, they're up about 400 rigs from a year ago, so that's a huge number from where we were. And at the current price levels, you're just not going to see any kind of collapse in U.S. shale production. So I'm not sure the – I guess it's encouraging the rig counts – are dropping maybe one or two or only growing by one or two as opposed to six or seven or eight on a weekly basis. But I don't think that's a signal that we're going to see some kind of decline in U.S. production here. I think the reverse is probably true. At this level, I think shale is finding ways to not just survive, but to really thrive these price levels. So I think we're kind of stuck here with rising U.S. production. 
And it's a sort of a new factor that OPEC has to put into its calculus as it makes decisions going forward. Let's move on to geopolitical risks, starting with Venezuela. I asked an oil trader friend of mine if she could think of any questions I should ask you. And she said, you got Joe McGonigal on your, on your program? He's, he's, he had like a senior role in government. He might be the only guy in the oil market who could decode Trump speak for us and tell us what it is exactly that this administration is threatening Venezuela with. Because a lot of people can't figure it out. You know, if, if you outlaw the import of Venezuelan oil into to the United States, that is a, a really damaging blow, but it's a blow to U.S. refiners who need that Venezuelan heavy crude for blending stock. So what's going on here with these threats of sanctions, and how do you see it playing out? Yeah, I think we're definitely entering a phase now where geopolitical events are really going to have an impact on, on oil markets. You know, really, over the last two years, there have been geopolitical events, but the market has sort of yawned at them because of the huge supply glut. So they've had no impact where in normal years when we didn't have such a big supply glut, you would have seen the market react pretty vigorously to some of these events. The two events that we're going to talk about today, I think, are so big that, that the market is definitely going to pay attention to it. It potentially could be a three million barrel a day impact on oil markets. And the first one is Venezuela. And what I think what makes this also fun from an analyst perspective is really uh, Trump himself and trying to interpret, you know, what he actually means. Uh, you know, sometimes a lot of it is just sort of positioning and art of the deal type stuff. But on, on other things, he actually means it. And so I think it's important to kind of differentiate between the two. On Venezuela, I think they're quite serious about taking really strong action. And, you know, this is something that really came about in May when Maduro started making sounds about this uh, move to have a new election for a, a new assembly, which would essentially dissolve the old assembly, which has now happened, and write a new constitution and essentially install a, a dictatorship in Venezuela. All of that has happened. When, when it leaked out, I think, in May that the National Security Council was actually considering options here, it was really rebuffed, I think, for the reasons you talked about, that it would really hurt U.S. refiners. So I think the market sort of just really just dismissed it uh, out of hand. But over the last several weeks, they've been developing a set of options for the president. And it came to a head about probably about uh, mid-July, like, you know, July 15th, around that period. And um, sort of in advance of these elections, which took place on July 31st. And essentially, there are very strong advocates for taking the strongest possible action against Venezuela and, and really the Maduro regime in order to bring it down. And it's the Western, you know, to get too much in the weeds here, but it's really the Western Hemisphere section of the National Security Council. There's a lot of dissension in the administration about this, too. The State Department is opposed to this stronger action because of what they view would be some kind of humanitarian crisis that could ensue. The Energy Department is opposed because of, as you point out, the, the impact on refiners. But I think there is a feeling within the National Security Council that this is a move that they have to make in order to bring about change, that really Duro has kind of crossed what uh, Trump's red line, as I like to say, by, by these elections. And so I think they're really far out there now. This move is also supported by sort of the anti-Castro crowd in Florida, which has a lot of tremendous influence on the president. I don't know if you saw his speech that he gave in Miami when he sort of changed the Obama-Cuba policy. It was probably the most enthusiastic crowd and speech that Trump ever gave on sort of a policy proposal, you know, absent the rallies that he's been giving that, is, that are more of a political nature. And he really feeds off of that type of atmosphere and Senator Marco Rubio, who, of course, is Cuban, is, is a big proponent of aggressive action in Venezuela. You know, the, for, for that community, first of all, there's a lot of Venezuelans in Florida to begin with. But the anti-Castro crowd really sees the Castro influence in Venezuela. You know, the, the, 
Cubans have dispatched advisors to help Maduro try to crack down on protests and are really have a very close relationship with him. So there, there's a lot of support in that community for it. And I think, you know, certainly there's no sugarcoating this. I mean, definitely there is a big impact on U.S. Gulf refiners who really have their refineries are built around refining this heavy Venezuelan crude. So they will be really hurt by this potential action. I mean, there really is not any kind of replacement option for them. I mean, you have Canadian oil sands crude, which which is a is a, of a heavier crude, which could be a replacement. But the problem is, from a logistics standpoint, there's no way to get that oil to the Gulf. You know, had we had Keystone in place, that potentially could have been a solution. But Keystone is not in place yet, even though it was approved by by the current administration. Mexican and Colombian crude are somewhat of a of a replacement for Venezuela crude, but but they're really their their production is is down, and I think they don't really have a lot of extra supply for these Gulf refiners. So I think what you what you would see, you would probably you know first they try to find some potential crude replacement on the spot market, which would be you know more expensive than than what they're paying now. But there really isn't going to be a lot of that. And I think what you would see is they would essentially have to cut refinery runs. So I think as a result, you would see, you know, certainly you'd see gasoline prices rise in the U.S., which from a political standpoint, I think is causing some pause in the administration. But also, I think you would see uh, oil prices rise by as much as uh, $10 a barrel WTI prices here, at least in the short term. From Venezuela's standpoint, they're not going to be able to find a replacement destination either for for this crude. China is is of course a big taker of consumer Venezuelan crude, but they're mainly getting the oil in return for big loan loan payments from Venezuela. But they're kind of at their max, I think, levels right now. The Russians are now engaging as another potential option, but they're really just trading the oil. And I'm not really sure how much more they could step in to be a savior there. So I think short term, it's going to be a mess. I don't think Venezuela is going to find a lot of options for that oil. I think it would bring about a collapse, a default in Venezuela, because about 40 percent of of all of production is used to pay off these loans to China and Russia and elsewhere. The rest of it, it goes either for in domestic consumption, which is a very small part. And the rest goes to the U.S., which is essentially the ATM machine for Venezuela. If you shut that down, Venezuela is in a world of hurt. And, and I think it would definitely bring about certainly a default, although you, you, know, you could argue that could happen anyway without strong U.S. action. But it, it could bring about a collapse of PDVSA and Venezuela crude production altogether. I think it would definitely bring about a collapse of the government. So what's get inside the mind of these policymakers in the White House? I mean, I think they think they acknowledge that there would be pain and impacts to U.S. refiners and gasoline prices and and oil prices. But I do think they think it's short lived and worth the geopolitical change that it would potentially create. So I think since the president made his statement on July 17th and a pronouncement of strong and swift economic action, that energy sanctions are at the top of that list. Now, what form that takes, whether it's ban on Venezuelan crude to the U.S. or it's a ban on dollar transactions of Venezuelan crude, I'm not quite sure yet, but they are trying to have the biggest impact they can on Venezuela. So I, I know I think I'm kind of out of consensus here. I do think they're going to make this move. You know, I think timing wise, I think we're coming to a decision point soon. The president's now back from his vacation and the White House staff who took some time off is also coming back. So I think we're getting to a point now where we're about to see some kind of decision from the White House. So that's two million barrels a day that's potentially at risk now in Venezuela. So that would be a huge that would have a huge impact. Just the banning of Venezuelan crude to the U.S. could boost prices by ten dollars. If you had a collapse of PDVSA and Venezuela crude production, you know, you're probably looking at crude prices somewhere around $70 if that happens.
And, of course, the collapse of Venezuela could happen even without those uh, U.S. sanctions on crude, just as a result of the government failing, which is very possible. I want to move on, though, to Iran, which has added about a million barrels per day to global production since sanctions were lifted in 2016. Some would argue that that accounts for the lion's share of the present oversupply. So it doesn't seem like President Trump is a very big fan of how things have gone with Iran. What could go wrong there? How do you see it? playing out. Yeah, so so I, I discussed sort of the three million barrel a day blow uh, to oil markets. The two, two million was Venezuelan crude. The other million would be potentially from Iran. And the president since before the election has been one of the top critics of the Iran deal. He's called it the worst deal ever. He used even you know, stronger language than that to describe it. So I think a lot of people thought when Mike Flynn, General Flynn, left as national security advisor that the sort of the pressure was off and there really wouldn't be a U.S. action against uh, Iran on the nuclear deal. But I think people forget the biggest critic of the Iran deal is the president himself. <laughs> and I think we're starting to see that play out now. The, you know, the White House or the administration under the, the nuclear deal has to certify Iran's compliance every quarter under the nuclear deal. And so for the first two quarters, they in a certified compliance. The latest compliance uh, happened uh, last month, or the certification happened last month. It was a bit delayed, mainly because the president was just unwilling to do it. And he had to be convinced by his advisors that, that, he, had, that he had to do it. And I really think that is probably the last time uh, that will happen. And, and so therefore, I see the next compliance period, which ends somewhere around mid-October, as being a potential catalyst point here under the Iran deal. And so, I mean, a lot of people are focusing on the compliance, too. And I'm not sure the compliance is the right place to be looking. I don't, the White House could just decide they want to walk away from the deal regardless of how Iran's doing under the compliance. So that in and of itself is probably not the main thing to be watching. But I do think there's great risk to the Iran nuclear deal. And as you point out, you know, Iran has added about a million barrels a day to the global market after sanctions were lifted. You know, probably 80 percent of that goes to Europe. The rest of it, you know, goes to South Korea, Japan. Uh, Some of it goes to China. And so I think you could argue that if the U.S. reimposed sanctions, you know, maybe China doesn't agree with it. But if you're uh, an energy company in Europe or in South Korea or Japan, you're not going to want to cross U.S. sanctions. Now, the pushback to this, and again, I think I'm, I'm kind of out of consensus on this, although I think people, even those that worked in the Obama administration as part of the the, the negotiating team on on the Iran nuclear deal are starting to come around to the realization that the deal is on thin ice from the U.S. perspective. But the pushback really is that the Europeans won't go along with this and therefore U.S. sanctions won't, you know, reimpose U.S. sanctions really won't have much of an impact. And, and the foreign minister of the EU has actually gone as far as saying she guarantees that the nuclear deal will remain. There's basically no way for the EU to guarantee this. I mean, they can decide to to not join the U.S. and reimpose sanctions. But without the U.S., they're really in a tough bind. And that's because the European governments themselves don't buy this oil. It's their energy companies. It's Total. It's Eni. It's Repsol. It's BP. You know, they these companies have big exposure in the U.S., so they're not going to want to cross U.S. sanctions. I mean, already, I think you see some of this playing out in Iran now because of the threat of future sanctions. I mean, even though it's perfectly legal for these companies to go into Iran and some are you know, signing MOUs and things like that and banks are allowed to go back into Iran, they're very nervous, I think, about doing it just on the threat of U.S. sanctions. So I think U.S. sanctions would, in essence, reimpose international sanctions on Iran. And and most of that one million barrels a day come off the market.
A lot of people think the reason that the U.S. dollar has remained the world's reserve currency 45 years after the Bretton Woods system collapsed in 1971 is the so-called petrodollar system, in which Middle East oil producers price their oil in U.S. dollars regardless of who it's being sold to. And many of those nations also reinvest their profits in U.S. Treasury bonds. But recently, we're seeing pressure from Russia and China to stop transacting in dollars. Iran, in particular, seems to have come to favor euros over dollars for its oil exports. So do you think the petrodollar system or even the U.S. dollar's hegemony as a global reserve currency is at risk in the longer term in light of these developments? And what do these changes mean for the price of oil as you look ahead? Well, first of all, I'm, I don't profess to be an expert on, on currencies and its impact on, on you know oil prices. But I mean, certainly historically, there's been an inverse relationship between the dollar and, and oil prices. I do think the supply glut has kind of interfered a bit with that you know, relationship, and it hasn't necessarily worked in clock, as clockwork as it has in the past. I'm not sure that the moves by China and Russia are really going to have that much of an impact or any impact at all. So I do think the dollar really remains the, the, you know, the preferred currency, not just in oil, but in, in commodities in general. I will tell you an interesting um, story from my time at, at DOE. When oil prices you know, really surged to $100 levels, the Saudis, and in particular, Minister Naimi uh, at the time, the oil minister of, of Saudi Arabia, really talked out loud about potentially changing the currency for oil prices from dollars to euros, uh, just so that they could lower those skyrocketing prices they felt were sort of impacting demand and and having an, a greater impact on, on markets than, than it probably should. So certainly, I think market participants are, are looking more at currencies right now, but but I don't really put much stock in you know the moves or the noise, I guess I would characterize it from from Russia and China. I want to come back now to a topic you brought up earlier, which is Saudi Arabia's planned IPO of Saudi Aramco in 2018. It stands to reason, as you alluded earlier, that they would want to do everything they possibly can to support oil prices into that IPO because, of course, the the whole future of their country kind of depends on the money that they'll raise from doing this. Some analysts, though, are starting to question the viability of the IPO and are wondering if it's really going to happen in 2018. What's your take, Joe? Is the IPO of Aramco going to happen? And what will it mean in terms of OPEC, Saudi Arabia, oil prices before and after the event and so on? Yeah, so I think it's hard to really overstate how important the IPO is to the leadership in Saudi Arabia and what they view as their future path, not just from an economic standpoint, but from a political perspective uh, as well. So I think the IPO continues. I know there's a lot of disagreement and debate out there about whether it will happen or not. They they haven't really identified the exact time in 2018 when it will happen. I actually think it is probably more the first half of 2018. But I think it's a top priority of the Saudi Arabian government, certainly of of the new crown prince. It's his kind of signature issue. So there's a lot of there's a lot at stake here, even from a reputational standpoint. I, so so therefore, I don't think they they pull away from or or delay the uh, the IPO. I think it definitely happens in in 2018. But I and and so I think the IPO is really driving oil policy now in the kingdom. And so you know, last year a lot of people were saying, oh, the Saudis are going to do certain things because of the IPO. And I really dismissed a lot of that because it's impossible to really time, you know, this market, especially if you're more than a year out. But as we get closer and closer to 2018, and that November 30th OPEC meeting is awfully close to 2008, I think you're going to start seeing the IPO really start to drive the Saudi oil policy. And that's why I do believe that the Saudis are willing to take even more aggressive and even unilateral action if they can't get the rest of OPEC to agree in order to try to boost prices and to really to to try to time it for the IPO. I think absent the IPO, they would probably be okay with where prices are right now. 
But the IPO is definitely going to be driving their policy going forward. So I'm not predicting that that's going to happen. But I think it's it's definitely now within the realm of possibility. I know there's a lot of people who dismiss that. I know the Saudis have actually said themselves that they won't take unilateral action. But just look at last year when the production cut deal happened. You know, they took a greater share of the burden for the production cuts. And then what happened in January? They surprised the market and actually cut even above what their share of the cuts were. And and I think that really boosted the market enthusiasm for the deal. Um, they can do that again. They certainly have a lot of room to be able to have additional cuts, uh, unilateral cuts on their end. And so I definitely consider it to be part of the realm of possibility. Again, I'm not predicting it, but as we get closer and closer to that meeting, you know, I'll be definitely developing my analysis of what might happen uh, in consultation with friends uh, in the region. But I would have to put it back on the list of possible scenarios as we head to the end of the year. Several recent articles have suggested that the forward curves moving into backwardation are signaling that the rebalancing is working and are therefore predictive of much higher oil prices to come. Frankly, Joe, I'm not convinced. If I look at the last several cyclical tops in the WTI price around February 23rd, April 13th, and May 24th, the WTI curve moved briefly into backwardation, at least through 2018 and into 2019, uh, in some cases to a greater degree than it did more recently. But in every case, it didn't last. As soon as that cyclical top was in, the market rolled over and the backwardation was gone and we were back to a structural contango, at least in the WTI curve, not so much in Brent. The same appears to me to be playing out now with backwardation no longer apparent in 2018, even though it was there a couple of weeks ago. So do you think that there's anything to this view that the term structure is supposedly, according to some analysts, signaling that the rebalancing is working and that higher prices are just around the corner? Well, yeah, I mean, I think I agree with your analysis. I mean, I think, first of all, it's it's just not sustainable. I think it got a little boost here during the summer, especially with these drawdowns. And it's important to, to re- remember that, you know, this is what the market thinks is happening, but not what is indeed happening. Right. So and I obviously I don't I don't agree. I, I as I said earlier, I think that the the supply glut is going to continue. I think we're going to be in the upper ranges, even by the end of the current OPEC production deal that ends in in March 2018. So I personally don't see, I don't think the data supports where the market is now, but it's just not sustainable, I don't think, especially going now into the fall when you're going to see, I think, gasoline demand drop off and you're going to see refinery maintenance. And I think you're going to keep seeing rising U.S. production. So I, I agree with your scenario. I think, you know, certainly this is an area where trading differs from, you know, someone like me who looks more at fundamentals. But I think in this case, we're both in agreement. On a related note, I think very closely related, actually, Saudi oil minister Khalid al Fali commented very publicly, it seemed to me he was going out of his way to be public, in saying supposedly that Goldman Sachs and a few hedge funds were suggesting to him that OPEC should target oil prices in the back end of the curve, long-dated futures, as opposed to just the front-month price. Now, frankly, I think Al-Fali was was maybe playing the traders by intentionally trying to game them into front-running something that I don't see how they could actually do, because they're not natural sellers of long-dated futures. I guess they could go into that market, but you know that would be hard to explain and obvious that it was a manipulation. So uh, it seems like it worked. Right after those comments is when the WTI curve pushed itself into backwardation. And as you say, it didn't last. It wasn't sustainable. Uh, do you think that Saudi Arabia and or OPEC have any real and bona fide intention of trying to date or, or trying to target long dated futures prices? And if so, do you think they have any practical means of doing that? Or was this just a case of Al Fali trying to jawbound the market again by, by gaming the actions of some traders? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think this was one of the the tools that they go to when they meet with I- investors. It's not to you know, really broadcast what they're going to do. It's to try to get the investing community to take some action and try to influence their views of where the market is. So, so yeah, I mean, I definitely think they were trying to have an impact on on investors. 
you know, but I think that, you know, OPEC and the Saudis in particular, I think, would be better off if they, again, instead of focusing on sort of verbal intervention and sentiment, if they would focus more on supply, they would have much more success, I think, on the market. You know, you talked a little bit about uh, when we were talking about Iran, about Iran's added crude exports to the market has really undermined the deal. And I, I agree that that's true. The other actor that's really undermined the deal has been Libya and, and to some extent Nigeria. Both of those two uh, members of OPEC were exempt from the from the production cut deal because they were going through internal turmoil. Libya in particular, you know, is now, you know, from when the deal was done, it was like around 300,000 barrels a day, is now a million barrels a day. Libya, of course, is, you know, the, when they came back with uh, 700,000 barrels a day in 2014, I think was what really pushed OPEC over the edge. And when they decided to to uh, basically do away with uh, any kind of caps on production. So Libya keeps coming up in this role. You know, the compliance, I think, in July, according to Platts, was something like 115 uh, percent, the OPEC's compliance under the deal. But their production, OPEC's production, was some 750,000 barrels over their 32.5 million barrel a day uh, ceiling that they put in place. So, and that's all due to uh, Libya and and Nigeria to some extent, and and really undermining the deal. And that's why you know we didn't really get into it when you asked me the question. But I do think that Libya and Nigeria's exemption under the deal that their time may be up as we approach this next meeting. And uh, I know the Nigerians, I think, seem willing to play with OPEC on this point. You know, the current OPEC secretary general is a former Nigerian government official. And I think they're, I think, more willing to cooperate. The Libyans, I think, are less enthusiastic about being a part of uh, lifting the waiver. And of course, it would have to be by unanimous decision. That's how OPEC operates. But I do think there's a way to, you know, orchestrate a deal where, you know, they agree to some limit on production. I don't think we're going to see cuts in either case, but they at least agree to a limit on their production with some kind of escape valve in case there's some like new violence or insurrection or political instability in either place. So at least from OPEC standpoint of regaining the narrative, I think that's really critical and as I talk to more and more OPEC member country representatives in my travels and at conferences, it's something that they are very focused on. It was a big part of the, the meeting in Russia, that technical meeting in Russia. They're trying to figure out what to do about it. But that, I think, is another big uh, scenario to watch as we get closer to the uh, November 30th OPEC meeting. Well, I can't thank you enough for a fantastic interview, Joe. I mentioned earlier you were formerly the chief of staff at the DOE. These days, you're heading up the energy research team for Hedgeye. So tell us what's going on over there at Hedgeye. It seems like Keith McCullough is assembling a team of some pretty heavy hitters. We just interviewed Neil Howe a couple of weeks ago, for example. So what are you guys uh, out to achieve there, and where can our listeners find out more about what you have to offer? That's right. I mean, I was part of the Potomac Research Group that Hedgeye acquired about a year and a half ago. And really, it was, you know, really advanced thinking by the Hedgeye leadership to, you know, this is before anyone really thought Trump had a chance. And I think people were thinking Hillary was a shoe in and really would be a continuation of the Obama policies. Not that Keith or the leadership had a, a dog in the fight, but but essentially to, to take the policy research firm and to marry it with the equity analysts at, at Hedgeye, there's, I don't think there's ever been a time where what's going on in Washington is going to be influencing markets and companies, at least from an investor standpoint. So I think the Potomac acquisition by Hedgeye, which is now called Hedgeye, Potomac Research, which I'm part of, uh, I think it was a it was a really good move, and certainly from an investor standpoint, I think is an incredible asset to really understand what's going on. You know, I have you know I cover the energy policy and sort of geopolitics side of it as it relates to energy, but you know I have colleagues who follow sort of 
macro political views, but, uh, you know, very strong healthcare practice. Of course, it follows. That's been basically the topic nonstop for the first 200 some days of the administration. Telecom mergers or someone follows telecom. There's a former general that follows uh, defense policy and and which defense contractor stocks to, to watch based on who might get what type of contracts or what's going on in the defense budget. And so the, the, uh, the strength of the team at the Potomac Research Group in Washington, now being part of Hedgeye, I think has really given Hedgeye a big advantage, not just to their institutional clients, but also to the macro uh, retail client. And so listeners of your podcast, which I count myself uh, one of those and a big fan, uh, you know, because of your interest in energy and the, the various folks you've had on to talk about energy, I think would be well served to, uh, you know, to go to the hedgeye.com website and, and sign up. There's lots of trial offers, but even as a retail investor to really understand what's going on, uh, not just specific companies, but just from a macro standpoint and a process standpoint, which Keith is really uh, good at, as you know, from, from your discussion with him. I think they'd be well served to uh, tune in and and check out Hedgeye. Well, I couldn't agree more, and I want to touch on a point you just made. You know, a lot of what we talk about on this show is at an institutional, more professional level. And we have a lot of retail listeners in our audience who aren't able to trade futures directly, who, who are more in the ETF market. Our good friend Dan Holland at Hedgeye, who set up both this interview today as well as our interview with Neil Howe, was good enough to send me an email. Hedgeye has a product called Hedgeye ETF Pro, and it's specifically for retail investors who want an advisory service that shows them what ETFs to use in order to put trades on. So for right now, for example, they're short oil through the USO ETF. And they basically provide a service that's all about ETF advice for retail investors. If anybody's interested in that, Dan was good enough to send us a free trial link. So registered users in your research roundup email, you'll find a link to a free trial of Hedgeye ETF Pro. Uh, be sure to check that out. It's free. You can't go wrong. And and I can't thank you enough, Joe, for a fantastic interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at MacroVoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. You know, Eric, what a great interview with Joe McMonigle. But now joining us for our continuing post-game coverage of crude oil is Tracy Shukart, perhaps better known by her Twitter handle, at Shy Girl. Now, Tracy, I was particularly interested in Joe McMonigle's comments about uh, the geopolitical tensions that could arise, you know, when he was talking about Venezuela and he was talking about uh, what's going on in Iran and that it could drive oil prices. And it's interesting because we kind of look at the charts and we're looking at all the technicals associated with the price, but there's really some geopolitical things that can happen that could drive the price. What did you take away from that interview? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he had some really good points, especially, obviously, the two big ones, Venezuela and Iran. So I know in that he was talking about Venezuela and sort of the domestic problems that we would have if there were sanctions and we wouldn't be able to import their crude oil for refining. And kind of he touched on the fact that we could use uh, Canadian oil as a replacement, but there were logistical problems and supply disruption could add $10 to WTI. Though I do agree that there are logistical problems and they'll be a little bit more difficult to get Canadian crude down into the Gulf course, but you can use a system of pipelines and other transportation methods to get there. It would add to the cost transportation-wise to get there, but it is logistically possible. So I don't see that being a huge impact or as huge of an impact price-wise. Um, I also know that the refineries have been sort of uh, experimenting already. They've already inquired and have been experimenting with Canadian crude blends, blending them with Russian and Middle East. I think the refineries are a lot more prepared. I mean, they've known 
this has been talked about it. So they've already taken steps forward. If this is a possibility, what are we going to replace this with? All right. Well, thank you. Eric, what did you think of the interview? Well, great minds think alike. I was thinking very much along the same lines as Tracy was, but with a little bit of a different spin, which is it, the way I see it. Yeah, there could be upward pressure on price for sure if Iran and Venezuela went offline. But hedgers in the U.S. would start hedging like crazy shale operators because it would be such an opportunity for them. So you've got to believe one of two things is going to happen. Either the price doesn't go up nearly as much as Joe was saying. and It goes up much less than that. Or it goes up in a very rapidly developing backwardation. So the hedgers are hedging like crazy two years out. That's keeping those prices down around 50, 55 bucks. But we see this developing backwardation where the front month maybe goes up to 60, 65, even 70 bucks. Hard for me to believe that that could happen. But the market's kind of been primed with what I think are a lot of incorrect analysis where people are saying backwardation's coming into the market and it's signaling higher prices. Well, if you start to see higher prices and more backwardation, it kind of feeds on itself. People start to believe that round of analysis that was saying those things. So that's the only way I could see it happening. But I don't see the longer dated futures going anywhere above 55 to 60 absolute tops because the hedgers are going to be selling into that so aggressively. And I think they're smart enough that they would see that. They would know Venezuela going offline if that happened would be a short-lived event and they would use that opportunity to hedge very aggressively. What do you think, Tracy, about that view? Um, yeah, absolutely agree. There's sort of a, a window where you know, hedgers are going to start hedging again, and that's sort of above that uh, 48, 50, 49 area. Um, so absolutely, I don't see the back end really getting that high. It may push the front up some, but I still don't see 60 or 70 by any stretch of the imagination. You know, it may cause the initial kick up, but I don't think it would be anything that that would be lasting. Let's shift gears now, because what I'd like to do is review some charts with you, Tracy, and to give our listeners a sense of where this uh, is coming from. I think one of the most important things you can learn as a trader or investor is to know your own limitations. And, you know, I'm a fundamental thinker. I, I use technical analysis, but I would grade myself as an advanced beginner at technical analysis, whereas Tracy is, especially in the crude oil market, a, a real expert in technical analysis. So, we're going to refer to a set of charts that are, uh, there's a download link in your research roundup email. Looking at this first chart in that post-game chart book, I looked at a continuous futures chart. This is going back to the beginning of the year. And you see a nice, very clean, down-sloping trend line with a series of four progressively lower highs. The bottom of the channel, it's not really clear whether it's a channel or maybe a megaphone pattern. You could draw that bottom line at a different angle maybe, but you've got a series of lower lows. This is very much a bearish pattern. And what we've been waiting for, if you look at that rightmost high on the first chart, is we got a little bit above 48.50, which is where I thought it was going to roll over. I think it was Venezuela and North Korea that pushed us up there. We spent a little bit more time consolidating. You can see where I've drawn the green line with the pink arrow that says 48.50 pointing to it. That's the 48.50 price level, which was proving to be support tested six or seven times. And I'm sure that our regular listeners remember me saying a few weeks in a row, what I'm waiting for is a daily close below 48.50. I was looking at this area of the chart saying we need that confirmation that this is going to roll over the way it did the last three times. Once I saw that, and this chart only goes to about a week ago, that last red candle that you see almost touching the blue 50-day moving average, that was the 16th of August. And so at that point, and this would have been last week's show, I said, okay, we got a nice clean break down below 48.50. A uh, little bounce for just a day there, and then another acceleration to the downside, taking us right down to the 50-day moving average. And I think I said on last week's show, okay, it, it's on, guys. We're headed to 40 bucks now. Tracy told me in an email, no way, it's going to bounce to 49. And I thought, are you crazy? You know, look at how strong 
that 4850 support was. And the rule is whatever is support in the way down becomes resistance in the way up. I thought, no way we're going back above 49. Tracy was extremely confident in that view. Well, sure enough, let's look at the next chart, which adds an extra week's worth of data to it. And you can see the very next day, not only do we see a very major bounce, but it took us, it wasn't actually 49, which Tracy said. She fell eight cents off of uh, where it would be. It was 48.92 was the high print there. But going through that 48.50, what I thought should have been a strong resistance line. And as I saw that, and then that next line coming up again, testing 48.50 on the last green candle that you see on the chart there, where it says very strong rejection of the 50-day moving average. I just thought, wow, what is going on here? Because this rejection of the 50-day moving average, the bounce, is much more aggressive than I expected it to be. And I should have mentioned, by the way, I've switched here to a nearest futures chart. For anybody who, who may not be familiar with this, Trend lines work better on a continuous futures chart. Moving averages work better on a nearest futures chart. If the reasons for that are not clear, go back and listen to my interview with Jack Schwager when we talked about his book on futures trading back in February, and we'll explain these concepts in that interview. But as I looked at this, I said, boy, what I was so convinced was going to be an acceleration of momentum to the downside is starting to look like a bullish cup and handle formation. And I thought, okay, as a technical analyst, I'm in over my head. I, I need to call my friend Tracy for some help here. Because Tracy so perfectly called that what was going to happen was this big bounce up to 49, which I sure didn't see coming. These first two charts here, I prepared. The remaining charts in this deck, Tracy prepared. So Tracy, why don't you tell us on this next chart, which is the market profile TPO chart, What's going on here? Because this is a different style of technical analysis than a lot of our listeners may be familiar with. What is this chart all about and why is it? did it allow you to predict that big bounce back up to 49 would occur after we tested the 50-day moving average? Well, it was a couple of things um, knowing that it was going to bounce. But the whole idea of the market profile chart is basically if you took the entire year together, what you want to look like and what most years look like is a nice bell curve if you took all these profiles and you, you know, stuck them all together so what we're looking for when we're looking for this and you can use it you know you can look at this at a monthly basis you can look at it at a weekly basis which i do um and then also a daily basis and the chart that we're looking at is just the daily basis so a real good example i just kind of worded out for you just to be able to explain this a little bit more when we saw that day on 817 you had this big fat bottom and then you had an area of repair an area of repair would mean that there are single prints that means single blocks um and then you had another big area of repair and then you had this very very weak top so i knew that the market likes to come back and repair these areas because they're incomplete auctions so what happens is the next day we hung out on top a little bit to fill out the top from the prior day. And then sure enough, the market came all the way back down to fill in these repair areas. So you can kind of use it as a guide like that. That's kind of how you can use it. And that's just a brief introduction. And just for our listeners' benefit, Tracy, this style of technical analysis is called market profile. And for anyone who's interested in learning more about it, the books to read are Mind Over Markets and Markets in Profile, both by Jay Dalton. Go ahead and tell us what the next chart is telling you. I knew the market was going to bounce because what happens is it was a rollover. Rollover loves these 50% retraces. So what I did is just took the 50% retrace from the prior move up. It almost got there. It didn't quite 46.62. The actual, it was actually 46.50. I was looking in that area to go long. And that's how I knew that it was going to bounce up right back up to that inflection point. If you look at this VOF chart, then we made another 50% retrace. And really, that all had to do with rollover and knowing that the market likes to do two 50% retraces, not all the time, but 90% of the time, it will make these moves. So I was pretty sure we were going to go right back up there. Well, that's, of course, what happened. And, you know, that made me concerned. If we go back to the second chart in the deck, the one that I drew, you can see here where I've got that green arrow going all the way up to 55 or so. I was concerned that this was turning into 
a bullish cup and handle formation, which could very easily target if it were to complete through the red downsloping trend line. It could take us all the way back to the top of that longer term consolidation range around $55. And I'm definitely not positioned for that. Now, what our listeners looking at the chart can't see here, this chart was prepared on Wednesday evening. Thursday, there was a big red down candle. I feel like I kind of got saved by the day in that I have a, a short position on in this market because, believe it or not, although it seems counterintuitive, I think it's actually Hurricane Harvey which caused that down move. And it, the reason that that would occur is even though it does shut in a lot of production that would normally be bullish, it's also going to directly affect refineries. They're evacuating refineries on the Gulf Coast the shutdown of those refineries is going to reduce demand. And that seems to be the reason for this. So I think today might have been an anomaly. Should I still be concerned, Tracy, about the risk? Uh, you know, I thought that we were not going back above 4850. I thought we were headed down from here. Do you think this cup and handle formation is a serious risk? Are we? Is there a potential of getting above 50 again here? Or do you think that the, what needed to play out has played out with the bounce that you already saw? Well, certainly we had this inflection point that took, you know, it went to this inflection point nicely rejected out of that and out of the monthly view up, came back down. We're kind of back now in this consolidation pattern going a little bit sideways right now. So if you look at the third chart, and I think I took a picture of that. And just to be clear, the third chart that you supplied is going to be the fifth chart, the last chart in the five chart deck that the listeners uh, received in the download. So what you can see on this, you can kind of see this cup and handle pattern. Now, we're still within this sort of handle. So I kind of expect this market to come down, test back down to 48.78 area. So what I kind of expect this to do is I expect this to come down and retest this lower end of this trend line where, you know, we're kind of in that 45.63 area. I'm waiting now to see if are we going to have a breakdown from there or are we going to have another bounce up? Now, what we could do is essentially this could become a new trend and we could just bounce back and forth forever and we don't go any higher. So what I want to be watching and what you want to be watching is for this upper trend line to be broken. Now, when the upper trend line is broken, that's when you want to start looking at, say, 51, 52 area. That's really how I'm kind of watching this. Now, if you do have a breakout that I would say 52, 53, it's definitely in play. However, until that trend line is broken, we're still in a downtrend. But I do want to say, I think this is coming back down to test 45, 45, 60. And at 45.60, we're looking for a break of 45.60, or we could be bouncing back up to that upper trend line again. So those are kind of the areas that I'm watching. I'm watching the upper trend line. I'm watching the bottom trend line. The lesson is, is that actually this could come up, you know, see where that notch is. I'm giving you a chart lesson real fast. You see where that notch is, where those two trend lines cross? It actually doesn't become bullish until it crosses over that. That's why I think we could possibly revisit up to almost 49.62. We could actually retest 50, and I would not be worried that this was out of a downturn. Okay, so just to summarize, we're really looking at those two trend lines. You're expecting that from here we probably drift down, maybe test 4560. You're going to be watching very carefully there to see whether we bounce off of it or break down further below it. If there is a bounce above it, that trend that right now is around 4950, of course, as we go out in time, the, the line is moving. But as long as we don't go above that line, you think we're still consolidating. If we did move above the line, that's where you get concerned about the upside risk that could take us as high as 51, maybe even 52. Is that a fairly accurate summary of your view? Yes. 53 even as possible. Okay. So 53 maybe to the outside. In that scenario. So let's move on from there now to look at your outlook for the rest of the year. We've been talking just about this immediate chart formation that's going on in the market today. What do you see for the rest of this calendar year? I listened to Joe, we all listened to Joe, um, and I absolutely agree with him. We're headed into a seasonal downturn. We're going to start having refinery maintenance season. We have gasoline demand go down. Um, so there's lots of reasons to be bearish the market just from a seasonal aspect. So, you know, I'm looking for, you know, maybe we have one more one more bounce and then I'm 
sort of the seasonal sell-off. Usually every year what happens is the, the Middle East nations start producing less because their summer needs go down and the market gets very excited about it as soon as those numbers come out, like first week in September, and they think, oh, great, production's down, we're it, and then reality sets in and the numbers come in and that's when we sort of had that seasonal turn. So the seasonal high is typically sometime around the first week of September. The seasonal low is mid-December. What would you see? Obviously, a lot of factors can change between now and then, but based on current circumstances, what price range do you think we're looking at around December? I would say around 40, 39, 40 is not impossible. It really depends on, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, there's so many midi- mitigating factors within uh, the oil industry. So many things can happen. But I would say that this current pattern, if we continue downtrend targeting on the lower end, I'll say 38 to 40. That's about what I've been looking at, so great minds think alike once again. But just to play devil's advocate, the other side of this view would be a lot of people would say, look, that just can't happen. We're getting to less than a year from the Aramco IPO. Saudi Arabia is not going to let us get below 40 bucks. They're probably not going to let us get below 45 bucks. They're going to start unilaterally cutting or doing whatever they have to do in order to manage the market. Do you think there's any substance to that argument? Or if not, why not? Well, I have questions whether this IPO is going to happen or not. But here's the thing. It's a seasonal downturn. And, you know, when I say that it could go down to these levels, I don't think it's going to be sustainable there. It's a seasonal turn. So it's not like we're going to be sitting at sub 40 for a year by any means. Also, their IPO is scheduled for 2018, which I don't think they'll even make the 2018. But in between that, what happens is we have the seasonal uptrend. So starting end of January up through May, we have the seasonal uptrend. So by that time, they don't have to do anything. Oil will probably be over $50. Well, Tracy, I can't thank you enough for joining us in our post-game segment. Folks, if you don't already, follow at Shy Girl. That's uh, Charlie Hotel India Golf Romeo Lima, Chicago Girl, uh, on Twitter. And Tracy, we'll have you back on the program next time we do a crude oil special. We really appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much for having me on. And folks, we're going to need to leave it there in the interest of time. Before we close, though, I just want to take a minute to thank some of the people that make this show possible whose names you don't hear every week. Brad Bashand is a volunteer who is the man behind our Twitter presence. This guy is still active duty in the military and is uh, helping us out as a volunteer, but I predict he is going to be a tycoon of uh, social media marketing once he gets out of the military. David Remley is our volunteer who edits all of those transcripts and turns them into proper English. We cannot thank David enough. Lucas Jedi Master Jaster, who does all of the editing to make us sound much smarter than we actually are in real life. I also want to quickly put a shout out to Dan Holland at Hedgeye, who was kind enough to hook us up both with Neil Howe two weeks ago and also with Joe for today's interview. Folks, definitely stay tuned for in coming weeks because we've got a lot of really exciting programming coming. Euro Dollar University featuring Jeff Snyder. Part one is next week. You've been asking for it. You asked for it. You got it. Euro Dollar University coming up. After that, starting on September 7th, we're going to have our fall lineup, which Patrick has been working on. Some really fantastic guests coming on the show then. We still need your help promoting it, though, so please forward the Research Roundup emails to your friends and colleagues. Retweet Tweet us. Remember, a retweet is better than just a like. If you're able to donate to help defray our production costs, use the donate button on our homepage in order to do that. Use our player embed to put a Macro Voices player on your favorite website. But most importantly, please register your free account at macrovoices.com. The more registered users we have, the more able Patrick is to recruit the very best featured interview guests every single week. Benefit to you is that you'll receive our free research roundup email, which never contains any advertising or marketing. It's just a competitive of links to all the coolest free stuff we could find on the internet each week. Patrick, what's in this week's research roundup? Well, first off, Eric, they'll find the transcript for today's interview. You'll also find the link to the charts that Tracy and Eric were discussing during the post game. You'll also find an article written by Charles and Louis Vincent Gav on the coming clash of empires, Russia's role as a global game changer. And there's also a link to an article from Ray Dalio titled The Principles That Divide Us Might Be Greater Than Those That Bind Us Together. You'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share the content with our listeners, 
send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we will include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to MacroVoices on iTunes to have MacroVoices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.